Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Sallallahu alihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma khfir lana wa li shaykhina wa li hadhirina wa sami'in. Wa li jami'i al-muslimin al-ahya'i minhum al-mayyitin. قال المؤلف رحمه الله تعالى في كتابه عمدة الطالب وإذا اشتد حب أو بدا صلاح ثمر وجبت لكن لا تستقر إلا بجعل ببيدر ونحوه فإن تلف قبله بلا تفريط سقطت والزكاة على مستأجر ومستعير دون مالك ويجتمع عش وخراج في خراجية وفي العسل إذا كان عشرة أفراق عشره أخذه من ملكه أو موات وفي المعدن إن بلغ نصابا ربع العشر وفي, وفي الركاز ما وجد من دفن الجاهلية جاهلية الخمس قل أو كثر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. so إن شاء الله تعالى we're going to be carrying today from زكاة الحبوب والثمار زكاة on agriculture. so إن شاء الله تعالى we left on this مسألة وذا الشيخ جسّت أصنع وإذا اشتد حب أو بدا صلاح ثمر وجبت. and we spoke about this before the two uh, um, uh, uh, conditions for either fruit or seeds. so for seeds, when you have to give zakat on seeds, they have to become hardened and to become a seed. اشتداد uh, الحب. and if you have fruit, the kind of fruit that is able to be given away as zakat, then it's بدو صلاح. For it to be ripened, and then he said, "لكن لا تستقر إلا بجعل ببيدر ونحوه." Basically, once they are picked, this is when zakat you take from the you take it from the zakat. Meaning, a person that's collecting the zakat doesn't go to the field and just without the owner's permission go and take zakat. They need to be put in the place where they're going to be dried, where they're going to be stored, if they're going to be needed to be dried from the sun, or so on and so forth, or a place where they're going to be preserved. And then from there, the zakat is taken. And then he says, فَإِن تَلَفَ قَبْلَهُ بِلَا تَفْرِيطٍ سَقَطَتْ Basically, if the farmer now has zakat, and some of his agriculture, uh, um, uh, uh, becomes rotten or something happens to them, they burn in a fire, they're stolen or something like that. The, the zakat that he has to pay no longer is wajib upon him on one condition, that there's no tafriq, that the telef, the damage done to his property, lam yahsul min aidi. It didn't happen because of him. Meaning that he took all the precautions that he should have taken to ensure that what he was going to give away in zakat would not be destroyed. And then after that, if it still happens that they some sort of afa or some sort of destruction happens to them, there's no zakat. However, if, he, uh, if his produce is destroyed or something happens to them that blemishes them and people can't consume them, and it happened because of his own laziness, because of him not doing his own due diligence, then zakat is still wajib upon him. But if he did not, if he took all the necessary precautions and the zakat still ends up becoming destroyed or something, then there's no zakat upon him. And then we spoke about this already. He said, was zakat ala musta'jirin wa musta'irin duna malikin. He said that the zakat on land, agriculture on land, it's for the person renting the land. We went through this mas'ala yesterday, uh, last week, afwan. This is the mas'ala where we need to start from. Okay, so this is a mas'ala now um, of zakat. If somebody has an ard, there's different types of aradi in al-Islam, different types of land in al-Islam. Historically speaking, 
if the Muslims took over a country, historically speaking, if the Muslims took over a country, and let's say the people who used to own the land fled, historically speaking, they flee the land, they just run away. Or the land, we've, the Muslim gov, uh, nation has made a deal with a bordering nation. And the Muslims, through some sort of arrangement, get ownership of that land. But it wasn't originally their land. The people who now are on that land, either Muslim or non-Muslim, have to pay something called al-kharaj. They have to pay something called al-kharaj. Kharaj happens every year. Land tax. You can just call it a land tax. The kharaj is... Al-Ushur is 10%. Al-Ushur. So, what the Shaykh here is saying is, let's say now, for example, there's a farmer. The farmer is farming on the land where there's a land tax, where there's kharaj. Then what he's saying is, he will have to pay his zakat on the land that we spoke about before, and he'll have to pay kharaj. We don't say that because you pay kharaj, you don't have to pay zakat. Or because you pay zakat, you don't have to pay kharaj. He has to pay kharaj. Okay? But the mess of kharaj is a separate issue. He's just bringing it here because in these days, a long time ago, Muslims used to obviously have much more land in their possession than they do now. And then now he comes to another mess here where the issue of honey. Is there zakat on honey? If a person has, if a person is a beekeeper, he has bees. Is there zakat on honey? So he says, وَفِي الْعَسْلِ إِذَا كَانَ عَشْرَةُ أَفْرَاقٍ عُشْرُهُ Okay, أَخَذَهُ مِنْ مُلْكِهِ أَوْ مَوَاتٍ According to the author here, the Mu'allif, he is of the opinion that honey, you pay zakat on honey. However, what appears to be the strongest opinion is that there is no zakat on honey. Because there's nothing clear from the Quran or the Sunnah, which is clear in terms of the Sunnah, maybe a clear hadith where there's no issue in the isnad, the chain of narration. There's nothing that indicates that one has to pay zakat on honey. And this is the viewpoint of, if I'm correct, the Ahnaf, the Hanafis, the Malikis, and the Shafi'is. So it's almost unanimous. The ones who go against it are the Hanabila, the Hanbalis. And their evidence is a hadith which was reported by Al Juzajani or Al Jawzajani. And it's a hadith of Umar, or a narration of Umar. It's a khabar, it's not even a hadith. Because not everything is a, uh, um, not every hadith comes from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's not a hadith which is a marfu', meaning it's not a hadith which is a statement of the Prophet. It's a statement of Umar radiallahu anhu. When it's said that when the Muslims took over Yemen, um, there were like honey, honey places where, uh, uh, what do you call it, where honey was growing naturally and things like that. So when they asked him about the honey, he said that the Prophet ﷺ said that they should take al-ushur again. Al-ushur. Al-ushur is a tenth. If the nisab is, the nisab for al- in this mas'ala for honey is Ten afraq. What's the equivalent of ten afraq today? Ten afraq today is 62 kilograms. But we're saying there's no zakat in honey anyway. There's no zakat in honey. But we're saying for those people who follow that, this opinion that there's zakat in honey, 62 kilograms. This is what they say. Okay? That's the uh, measurement for it in, in, in the... In, in the and in the modern, if we were to 
transfer the equation from the classical equation to the new measuring system of grams and kilograms. And they say that this mas'ala of honey is in, regard, is, is, is in reference to both types of land, the land which is owned by someone and the land which is not owned by anyone. The cat is still to be taken. Because in Islam, land, like I just said to you before, there's different types of land. There's land where there's kharaj, we spoke about just a minute ago. There's land which is mamluka, land which is owned. And then there's land which is ghayru mamluka, which is not, it doesn't belong to anyone. And with land that's not, that doesn't belong to anyone, a person can become an owner of that land through irrigating the land. Let's say there's a spot in the desert. A spot in the desert. Okay? The, the, the land doesn't belong to anyone. If a person now comes and starts watering the land, b brings basic irrigation to the land, and starts cultivating the land, then it's his. It's called Ihya al Ard. And the Prophet said, Man ahya ardan fahiya lahu. Whoever revives the land is for him. And many people did that before. Even my own grandfather, when he moved more than 100 years ago, when he moved from southern Libya to Niger, there was no, no one was there. Khalas. He made his own farm, put his camels, and khalas. And then we're here now, alhamdulillah, in Britain. How that happened? Wallahu a'lam. So, um, that's how it is even if you go to many remote parts of the country. Not this country, here even a long time ago. If somebody lives in a village, no one owns the land. They own the land. They were the first people there. They grazed the land and did this and did that. So that's how it is. So he's saying that it can refer to that if you own the land, if you don't own the land. Khalas, what can you do? Now, وَفِي الْمَعْدَنِ إِنْ بَلَغَنِي صَابًا رُبْعُ الْعُشْرِ Another masala. What about on this same type of land, land that belongs to nobody? Or even land that belongs to someone? Okay? And it has pre precious metals coming out of it. Precious metals. You find gold in the land. You find silver there. Because what's, what's ajib is, if you start to water the land, then you'll see gold. If you put water in the land and you start putting, you start actually moistening the earth, you'll start to see gold. Ajeeb. So the ulama here say that if you find gold or silver, then you have to pay rub al ushur 2.5%. If that, if that precious metal reaches the nisab, of gold and silver. And we're going to go to, we're going to be studying today, inshallah, if we can, the nisab of gold and silver. And then there's another ajib mas'ala here. I find it to be a mas'ala which is ajiba. If a person has land and finds a treasure from prior to Al-Islam, from Jahiliya. You know some people that go treasure hunting. I know a brother, he goes treasure hunting. He takes his, um, from a country, he's originally a farmer in the country that he's from. He came to the UK very young, but he still enjoys farming. So every weekend, he goes with a metal detector and goes to beaches all over the country trying to find treasure. And people find treasure. When you, with a metal detector, you can find gold from the Anglo-Saxons or something like that. Two, three, four thousand years old, you can find like coins or um, treasure. Sometimes they bury a person and then after the, they bury the person, they put necklaces all over. You find it all the time. So the Prophet Muhammad said that if you find a treasure from the time of Jahiliyyah, i.e. prior to Islam, you find treasures from the Roman Empire, from the Greek Empire, from 
Druids, there used to be people in this country called Druids before Christianity came. They were Druids, they were like witch doctors, people that did magic and stuff. When people before Christianity came, if you find a treasure from that, then you have to give away al khumus. You have to give away al khumus, a fifth. And the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, wa firrikazi al khumus. It's in Bukhari. Qalla am kathura, or qalla o kathura. Whether what you find is a lot or a little, there's a one off payment of a fifth of its value. Okay? You give a one off payment of khumus, a fifth. So whoever's found treasure, or if you find treasure, and it's very possible you find treasure, al-khumus. Okay? Now we move on to the next mas'ala. We move on to the next issue. And the next issue is zakat on gold and silver. Zakat on gold and silver. Tafaddal, you can read inshallah. Iqara' law zamah. Assalamu alaykum. Babu zakat al naqdain يجب في الذهب إذا بلغ عشرين مثقالا وفي الفضة إذا بلغت مئتي درهم خالصة ربع عشر عشرهما ويضم أحدهما إلى يضم أو يضم يضم I think is it there يضم أو يضم خلاص أحسن الله والحاكم but I think it should be ويضم ضم يضم Carry on. الله عليكم ويضم أحدهما إلى الآخر في تكميل نصاب ويخرج عنه بالقيمة وقيمة العروض إليهما ويباح لذكر من فضة خاتم وقبيعة سيف وحلية من منطقة ونحوها ومن ذهب قبيعة سيف وما دعت إليه ضرور ضروره كأنف. Okay, خلاص. That's very good. The mas'ala on gold and silver. The mas'ala on gold and silver. Oh, sorry, not gold and silver. Just back to the other mas'ala. The mas'ala on agriculture. What's the delil? The delil is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَآتُوا حَقَّهُ يَوْمَ حَصَادِهِ Surah Al-An'am, ayah 141. And there's many other ahadith. To go through the ahadith is going to, we're giving you the Mulakhas, we're just extracting from the ahadith. All of this comes from ahadith and ayat. But to study the ahadith and ayat and then jump to the practicalities, it will be difficult for us. So we're just getting the rules, the qawaid. And then after, inshallah, if we have time, we can speak about the adilla. Babu zakat al naqdain. The zakat of the two naqdain. Naqdain here means al dhahab wal fiddha. Naqdain here means dhahab wal fiddha. In Islamic, in the past, people used to do tijara with, a, a, in, in, with the Muslims anyway. And even all of, all, of, all of the ancient world, we didn't have paper money. We didn't have paper money. So the money that we have now, 10 pounds, 15 pounds, 20 pounds, there was no such thing as paper money. You paid for something in gold or silver or something else valuable. With the Muslims, for example, they used to use dinar, which is a gold coin, and dirham, which is a silver coin. And then any other thing which was copper, um, what's the other metals, just any metal they use, hadid, steel, uh, iron, anything they use, they would call that fulus. That's where the word fulus comes from. Fulus was any other metal that wasn't gold or silver. They used to call it fulus. Okay? Naqdain, or the, so naqd, when they talk about naqd, it's like the equivalent of paying in cash in the old days when you'd pay with gold or silver. Now, there's a, it's very important we understand this because it took me years in the jami'ah to understand this. Other people understood it straight away. So many issues are related to this. When you learn about riba, you're going to, it's going to be very difficult to understand this. So let's break it down. It's slightly off topic, but it's very important. So in the time of the Prophet Muhammad and the Sahaba, 
you could pay with gold or silver, but you could pay with something else. So let's say somebody has um, a sha'ir, like barley, wheat or barley, right? Let's say I want to buy 500 kilograms of sha'ir, okay? I might, I might not give him gold or silver. I might give him three cows. I own three cows. I'm going to trade my cows for your sha'ir. Do you kind of understand? It wasn't cash, always cash. Anything could be used as money as long as it's uh, valuable. And that was known as bartering. In English, they call it bartering. So I will trade my cows for your sheep. If I have camels, I will trade my camels for X, Y, Z. That, that's, that's how people used to trade. So we have to eliminate from our minds the idea that everything is paper money. Everything is not paper money. Okay, so how did paper money come into existence? Paper money came into existence... It's always been around in some form, but it's become prominent since for about six, six to seven hundred years in Italy. Because what happened was carrying gold was dangerous. If you went from one city to another city, you could get robbed for your gold. So what they ended up doing is you had some people, they would hold your gold for you. They would hold, so they were people that had amana, they were trustworthy. You gave them your gold and then they'll give you a piece of paper they'll give you like a receipt and they'll say, look, use this money. Say that you have given me 20 grams of gold. 20 grams of gold is, let's just say for the sake of argument, 20 grams of gold is 200 pounds. I give this person my 20 grams of gold. He says, I'll hold it for you. I'm going to give you a receipt that I'm holding for you. But take this paper and this can be used as money. Meaning that the person that you're buying the thing from, he can come back to me and I'll give him the gold that you owned. So this was like a receipt. Okay? Um, it's a very well-known uh, thing. Anyway, that made money, that made using money so popular that people started to use this all the time. What ended up happening is people used the paper so much, everyone forgot about the money in the banks. I mean, the gold in banks, in vaults, okay? To the extent that up until the 1930s, many currencies, you could go to the Bank of England or wherever it was, and you could exchange your cash for gold. That's what you could do. And that's why I think even still now, if you read somewhere on your notes, it will, it will say that you can technically go back and get your money for gold. Anyway, what ended up happening now is people or countries stepped away from using gold. So that's where you hear the word the gold standard. Your currency would, would, your currency would be based on the, the amount of gold that you owned. So a country would produce the amount of notes of cash based on the amount of gold they have in their vaults. Countries stopped doing that and they said that we have now come to a point where the money that we use, the paper money that we use, has now become intrinsically valuable. The money no longer represents gold in the bank. We have been using this system for hundreds of years. The money itself, the paper money now, has intrinsic value. So people don't need to go back to the banks anymore. And then in the 1970s and so on and so forth, many Western countries started to leave the gold standard. What immediately happened as a result of that? Inflation. Meaning prices went high. Prices went up. Inflation at a level that was not seen before. So the price of water 20 years ago is different to the price of water now. If you're a child, for example, and you see that frog, Freddo, is 20p now. It was 5p when I was, uh, uh, what do you call it, growing up. The, the Transformers, the Space Invaders or whatever it is, the Transformer Crisps, they're like 60p now. They were 10p. 10, I remember 10p sweets you get, penny sweets. 1p or 2p you get sweets. You go to a shop 20 years ago, with £5 you could leave with so many things. 
Now you can't get that. And not only are things more expensive, they're getting smaller. So what you could buy even just 10 years ago, 2000 and let's say 50, 2010, right? You could buy with one pound like a big packet of Doritos, huge. Now it's small. And when you touch it, it's filled with air to make it appear as if it's big. Chocolate used to be, I remember Polo's, uh, yeah, Polo used to be 20p. The chewing gum was 20p. One day bus pass for a day was even less than a pound. If you're a child or my age or something like that. Coca-Cola was 50p. Coca-Cola's not 50p anymore. A chocolate was 50p. Now a chocolate, if you go to the shop, a Cadbury's chocolate is £1.20. Because of inflation, gold, because gold has an intrinsic value, it stabilizes the cost of things. Things remain stable. Now that, um, now that uh, what do you call it, um, the currencies are no longer uh, governed by gold, in order, when an economic crisis hits a country, they print more money. The more money you have in circulation, the less the value is. And therefore, prices get higher and higher and higher. The reason why I'm saying this is because zakat on gold and silver is the way in which we pay zakat on our cash is based on gold and silver. So that was just a small introduction that I think is very important for us to understand when it comes to studying, uh, 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 what do you call it, zakat on gold and silver. Now, just on the, on the last thing, if we ever study riba, for example. Even in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we're not going to go through it now. But people would buy gold in return for other, gold against gold. Let's say I have gold from Delhi. I have gold from Delhi. And somebody has gold from Mecca. I would trade my gold, Delhi gold, for gold from, from Mecca. Or something like that. Or gold from Timbuktu, because Timbuktu is full of gold. Gold from Timbuktu in Mali for gold from Mecca. There are two different types of gold. So people will trade gold for gold. You can't think of that now. Because everything we use now is paper money. So you can't even imagine that. That's why when I, when I was reading Z, uh, Z, 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 gold against gold in, in Zakat, I was like, well, what's, what's going on here? It doesn't even make any sense. Who buys gold for gold? When does that ever occur? Because people don't use these things anymore. Everyone uses paper money. Even though paper money has no value itself. It's simply a means to buy something. It's a purchasing mechanism. But gold, but, but money in itself has no other alternative use. At least gold, you can, sorry, you can use it to fix your tooth. You can use it to beautify yourself. It has a long shelf life. It doesn't corrode. This is why people have given value to gold for such a long time. Okay? Gold never, generally speaking, gold does not devalue. So even somebody that, if you bought gold, let's say you bought 50 pounds worth of gold in 2020. You just bought it before COVID. Go and check the price of it now. It's maybe going to be more than, it's going to be more than 50 pounds because it stabilizes. So even, let's say you wanted to save money, a good thing to do is even just every month, buy a little 50 pounds worth of gold every month. And then just build it up and it will stabilize your savings. So now when you want to spend something, your money has not decreased in value. Anyway, putting that aside, now there's a cat for gold and silver. Tafadl. Oh, do you, oh, you read it. Afwan, you read it. Afwan. وَيَجِبُ فِي الذَّهَبِ إِذَا بَلَغَ عِشْرِينَ مِثْقَالًا وَفِي الْفِضَّةِ إِذَا بَلَغَتْ مِئَتَيْ دِرْهَمٍ Okay, the zakat for gold and silver is the following. Everyone here knows zakat of gold and silver because everyone has gold or silver or people use paper money. So we come across it a lot. There's the, 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 the zakat, the nisab for gold is 20 mithqals. 20 mithqalan, which is the equivalent to 85 grams. It's here in the book, the bottom of page 52. 85 grams. So 85, if you have 85 grams worth of pure gold, you have to pay zakat on it. You have to pay 2.5% of, of its value. Or you can give 2.5% of the gold itself away. And if you have silver, which is equivalent to 200 dirhams, which is 200 grams, okay, 
than is sub for, no, no, not 200 grams, Afwan, 594 grams. 594 grams is the nisab. 594. And if you, if you have the amount, that's the least, that's the, low, that's the nisab. So if you have at least that amount, you have to pay zakat 2.5%. Now, I checked the price of, of gold today. And the price of gold as of today for one gram is 67 pounds, two pence. 67 pounds, two pence. So if you times 67 pounds, two pence by 85, what does that give you? Someone open their calculator, inshallah, and tell us. Let's see what that gives us. 6702 times 85. What does that give us? What's the nisab if you have gold? If you have this amount of gold, khalas, you must pay. How much is it? 5696.7. So you have to have 5,696 pounds, 70 pence as of today. It might go a bit up, it might go a bit down. Now, zakat, I mean, the, the, the nisab for, for silver is, as of today, 81p. Silver doesn't stand the chance. Poor silver. Times that by 594. How much does that give you? If we were to time silver by 594, what does that give us? 81p. Ah, my phone is here. Afon. How much? Yes. He said 475.2. So if you have 475 pounds, 20 pence, and you have that for an entire year, that amount, and that's the price today, you might go down, silver's very volatile, then you have to pay the cat on that. On both of them, you have to give 2.5%. However, there's a catch. The zakat that you have to pay on gold and silver is pure gold and pure silver. So, I didn't know about this personally because I'm not a dealer in gold and thingy. So when I was, this is years ago, I had to look. So, I heard about it, but I didn't know. So, gold obviously is in carrots. The purest gold that you can get is 24 karat gold here in the UK or in the West, generally speaking. 24 karat gold is generally speaking seen as the most pure. There's no gold which is 100%, but it's like 99 out of 1,000. Gold has this metric, and the metric is out of 1,000. And 24 karat gold is 999, okay? Below that, and remember, different countries have a different carat system, but it's still not, the carat system doesn't, doesn't affect us. We'll just have to learn how to calculate it, which is fine. Now... That's the closest thing we have to pure gold. Then after that in the UK here, we have 22 karat gold. 22 karat gold, right? 22 karat gold. And then you have 20 karat gold, and then you have 18 and 14 karat gold, okay? So 24 karat gold is our nisab. 24 karat gold, so pure gold, 85 grams of pure gold, okay? Then we have the other types of carrot. And basically, the other types of gold are not as pure. So what that means is the metal is mixed with other things to make it come together. So it can be mixed with just other metals, and they call it alloy as well, just to bring it together. Okay, so 14 karat gold, 18 karat gold, so on and so forth. The nisab for 22 karat gold, and this calculation is Ramadan, but it's a good estimate. The nisab for 24 karat, karat gold, you would need to have, if you have 22, 22 karat gold, you would need to have at least 92.65 grams. 
because it's not pure. Pure gold is 85 grams. So we are now going the standard, the gold standard is getting lower and lower because the gold is mixed, which means that now the nisab is going to be higher. So 22 karat gold has the nisab of 92.65 grams. 20 karat gold, 20, if you have 20 karat gold, the nisab will be around 102 grams. Okay? If you have 18 karat gold, the nisab will be 113 grams. And you can add 0 0.05 if you wish. 14 karat gold, 145 grams, 0 0.35. 145 grams, 0.35. Okay. How do you calculate this? How would you calculate it? If you have 22 grams, how did we get here? Does anyone know? What would you mathematically do just to reach this nasab amount? Does anyone know? Have a brief idea. How would you do it? Yes. Okay. So give me, give me. So let's say 22 karat gold. What would we do? We have 22. The golden standard is 24, right? So what would we do with the number 22 and 24? And then that amount that we minus, what would we do with that? Okay. So let's do that formula. And let's say we have 150 grams of 22 karat gold. 150 grams. So what do we do now? People hit, okay, go on. Okay, so give me, we've got 150 in the calculator. What's the next move? Oh, you didn't tell me what to do. What's the next move? I have 150. What do I write now? Plus, minus, subtract. Okay, minus 85. We have 65. Excellent. There's several methods, by the way. So you could be 100% right. Nah. Okay, one second. So we've got 65. So 150 minus what? 150 minus, he said... 85 gives us 65, and then 65, you're saying we divide that by? Seven point six. Okay, and then what do we do? Divide by 7.65. So now we have 8.4. We'll just say 8.5. What do we do this 8.5? We times that by what? Okay, so we hit a block. Who's got another thing? I know some people know this. Just let's be interactive. What can, yes. Okay, 150. Okay. So 150 grams of 22 karat gold. Yes, it's 22 karat gold. 22 karat. No, this one's no. We just want to say, how, do, how did we reach? If we Okay, yeah. What do we do? So we've got 150 grams of 22 karat gold. Exactly, the sums was 92.65. How did we get there? How did you calculate that? Ah, exactly. So now we have to do some division. 20, I would say we do 22 divided by 24. Okay. And what does that give us now? That gives us... So we have to divide the carrot that we're dealing with against the gold standard, which is 24. So we have 22 carat gold. Divide that by 24, which gives us 0 0.19. 0 0.91. I'm 
I'm not a mathematician. Jazakumullah khair. 0.91. Okay. We have 0.91. What do we do with 0.91? What do we times that by? Or what do we do next? 0.91 is now, this represents what? This represents the value of our gold, the purity of our gold. Okay, so now what do we do? What's the next step? 85 decided, yes, 85. Okay, hold on. We can do that. Can we just times this now by 150? Can we? Who, who thinks we can and who thinks we can't? With 0 0.95 now, sorry, 0 0.91. So what do we do? We multiply it by what? 0 0.91 is our purity level. And we have 150 grams of gold. In order to find the nisab, what do people think? That, I don't want to, let's just try to use, it's, it's, it's not trying to single out anyone. I just want to see our mode of thinking. Is there another step we have to do? Do we have to times it by the weight of the gold that we have now? Or not? What, what's the next thing? Let's try. Let's times it by 150. We get 100 and. So that may be we're missing a step. 136.5. Perhaps we're missing a step. And perhaps what the brother said there was correct. Anyway, never mind. We'll come back to this, inshallah ta'ala, next week. I want people to go home and look at how to find the purity of zakat, of gold. It's very, very, very simple. A quick Google search, find it. Who thinks they want to try it again? Anybody want to give it a second try? With your, what do you call it, with your calculator? Nobody wants to give it a try. How do people work out their zakat at home? What would you do if you had 150 grams worth of 22 karat gold? How would you find it out? Let's say, for example, let's use 18 karat. 18 karat is 75% purity. So what would you do? Okay, 18 divided by 24. 18 is our purity amount, is our current purity amount. And we are dividing it against what? The gold standard, which is 24. So 18 divided by 4, does that give us, Akhi? 0 0.75, yes, exactly. Which is the percentage of the purity that we have. Okay, what do we do next? Okay, so now, inshallah ta'ala, we'll come back. Anyway. We'll come back to that. I want people to think about that. Please come next week with that. Now, with the next mas'ala, we're going to come back to that. So now the same issue applies with silver. With silver, we have to divide or we have pure silver. The difference between gold and silver is that silver has no, there's no absolute pure silver. With gold, we have something close to an absolute with silver, there is no absolute. Silver is always mixed. So we are always going to be trying to, we're always going to have to be making some kind of division with it. Now, let's move away from the application. We'll do that next week. I want people to look and come with some answers. But let's speak about now zakat on our salaries. The issue of zakat now with our salaries, or how do we base zakat? How do we pay zakat on our salaries or the money in our bank? How is that ruling assessed or how does it come into being? The reason why we pay zakat or we pay 2.5% of our wealth, of our paper money, shall I, or rather, yeah? Well, the reason why we pay 2.5% of our paper money is because we base the rulings of paper money on the zakat of gold and silver. So the, the, there is no zakat, there is no real zakat uh, nisab for paper money. We base our ruling, we make an analogy between the paper money 
and gold and silver. Yes. Exactly. This is, this is, this is another issue. This is what you call a nazila, a new fiqhi issue. So, we base our zakat on gold and silver. Because gold and silver traditionally in the past was used as a form of currency. Now that gold and silver are not generally speaking used as a currency in and of, in and of, its, in and of themselves, even though they're still used in jewelry and other things, we attach the ruling of money to gold and silver because it's the closest substitute. It's the closest similar thing that you can make an analogy with. Qiyas. Okay. Now the question is, gold has one nisab and silver has one nisab. They're separate entities. They can sometimes be joined together, and we'll get to that next week, but we're only going to do that after we finish our calculations. But the question is, if gold and silver are both separate entities, what do we attach money to? Another question I our brother asked us here, he said to us that money is no longer backed by anything. The cash that we have is no longer backed by anything. So why in reality are we basing it on gold and silver? Well, the reason why is because even though it's not attached to anything, it's still currently in the current modern world, it's still being used as a currency. And it still has, even though it comes from a particular authority, it still has purchasing power. You can still purchase with it. And because of that, the ulama say the safest thing to do is to pay the zakat on it. That's what we have to do. Otherwise, if we don't do that, we'll just know nobody pays zakat, nobody receives the zakat. And that's a form of fraud. That's a technicality almost. That's a technicality. So because Al-Islam calls us to pay zakat and to give to the poor, yes, that particular thing no longer represents gold and silver. Because we're God-fearing Muslims, we still have to يعني, implement the sharia to a certain extent and pay someone. We can't just say, khalas, there's no money. It's, I mean, we can't just say, khalas, there's no intrinsic value to it. Salaamu alaikum. It's not gold or silver anymore. We say that because of the fact that it's used today in trade, everybody uses it in terms of internationally. If you send it to Asia, if you send it to Africa, if you send it to Europe, people can still use it. Poor people can still use it. Khalas, we give zakat on it. Whatever it may be, and we go, if we were, whatever the source of the thing may be, it's just printed by a machine. That's doesn't matter in when it comes to the actual effect on the ground that's more of a theoretical issue and it's still a problem it's a problem but on the ground right now if you give a poor person in the developing world some cash he can use it to pay money and therefore it has purchasing power and therefore we equate it to the zakat of gold or silver now the question is do we attach it to gold do we attach it to silver Ikhtilaf between the ulama. Some ulama say we attach it to gold. Some ulama say we attach it to silver. Excuse me. Majority of the ulama of the opinion that the zakat should carry the nisab of silver. That zakat should carry the nisab of silver. And the reason why they say that it should carry the, the nisab of silver is because more people are able to pay the zakat of silver. Most people don't have in their bank accounts today 5,000 pounds. Most people don't have that cash disposable. Some may have it, and when you have it, you may think other people have it, but generally speaking, <clears throat> people do not have that amount of money just laying around. However, What's the nisab for silver? Somebody times 81p with 95595 five, five, or 5045. What's the, what's the nisab for silver again? 
So somebody times that by 81, 0 0.81. 470, so yeah, people are going to have 470 odd quid in their bank account. People are going to have that. But now another issue comes into play. What is somebody divide that amount now by 0 0.25? Let's say somebody has 500 pounds in their account. What's 500 pounds divided by, or what's 2.5% of 500 pounds? Just divide 500 by 40. 500 pounds divided by 40, how much is that? 500 divided by 40 is 12 pounds. Now here's another issue. Are you going to tell me that you, it doesn't matter if you go to the poorest country on earth, 12 pounds is not enough for a person to live off of zakat for a year. And, some, and the ulama, they say that zakat should be enough to enrich a person for an entire year. And 12 pounds does not enrich anyone. 12 pounds maybe in the poorest of country can buy you. If you was to give someone 12 pounds and all they were to buy is food, maybe six months worth of rice, oil, maybe oil for six months, and then maybe, like we said before, some dal or black-eyed beans or something. He can't even buy meat and things like that much. So you're literally just giving him oil and a bag of rice, what kind of zakat is this? So that's where some ulama say no, it should be gold. The zakat of paper money should be gold. Because at least with gold, he's going to be getting maybe around 150 pounds. That's better than getting 12 pounds. Yeah, I need 12 pounds thingy. And then there's another mas'ala with silver now. 500 pounds, the zakat is supposed to be given from the rich to the poor. يُؤْخَذُ مِنْ أَغْنِيَائِهِمْ Prophet ﷺ said when it, uh, to Mu'adh bin Jabal when he was being sent to, Mac, uh, to Yemen he said that once they accept that there's no God where they worship except Allah and that the Prophet ﷺ is his final messenger <clears throat> and then after they accept that and they accept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to has ordered for them to pray five times a day then tell them that after that, every year they need to give money, zakat, that's taken from the rich, and it's supposed to be given to the poor. 500 pounds in no one's world today is rich. 500 pounds, you can spend 500 pounds in a day and you wouldn't even notice it. You wouldn't even notice it. You drive to London, you fill up your petrol tank, you pay the congestion charge, you pay for some parking. Let's say you wanted to uh, go to, what do you call it? You wanted to go to central London to do some shopping. Even now you can buy it off of Amazon, I know. Let's just say, you drive to London, you got an empty tank. How much do you have to put inside the tank? 50 pounds. You drive to London, you pay the congestion charge. How much is that? 50, let's just say 15, 20 pounds. Khalas. How much is that now? 70 pounds. You park your car. You want to shop for three hours. How much are you going to have to pay? At the very least, in central London, you're going to be paying maybe 35. That's 100 pounds. Salam alaikum. Finished. And then now, you've got 400 pounds to spend. Let's say you want to buy some stuff for your house. You get a flat tire. One time I had to, I got a flat tire out of nowhere. I had to pay 90 pounds just straight on the, on, on the you know, on, on the spot just to fix yeah, I need this kind of tire that I had. What I'm trying to say is that you can spend this amount of money very easily and you won't be considered as rich. So there are some problems with the opinion that zakat has to be taken from silver. Even with all those considerations, the ulama still say pay zakat on silver because at least the poor get something. At least the poor get something. So that's why I say that everyone, I need the zakat is to be paid the zakat needs to be paid on the nisab of silver. Because at least then the poor have something to have. Yes, it's not a lot, 12 pounds, not a lot, 30 pounds, not, but it's better than nothing. And the more money you have, you can give zakat. If you have, let's say you have about 5,000 pounds, five, six, 7,000 pounds, the poor person will be receiving maybe two to 300 pounds in zakat. So alhamdulillah, it's something. But if we were to say it's gold, even though there's many strong elements of that opinion which are correct, and in most of the population would not be able to pay zakat in gold because many people don't have 5,000 pounds in their account. 
So it's a new age issue. It's a new age issue that affects us all. So, inshallah ta'ala, I think that we'll come back with the calculations um, next week. There doesn't appear to be any questions either here. We'll give it a few minutes or one or two minutes if questions appear on the screen. Mm. The fadl. Exactly. Imagine giving someone 25 pounds, even in this country. Imagine for brother, what can 25 pounds get you here, Achi? Can 25 pounds can't pay your rent. 25 pounds can't even pay Sky Tennis. Sky Tennis, which is, you can't. It's not, you can't even afford Sky TV, Sky, Sky Sports. You can't even get 25 pounds. So, but alhamdulillah, still, you can send it abroad. And even with the zakat, if you're a person that pays zakat here, try to even give it here as well. Try to give it. We'll get to that when we get to the people who are deserving of zakat. But you should try to give zakat to the people in the country that you live in first. And believe you me, there are people in this country that are struggling. At least, alhamdulillah, back home, the people live on the land and they have each other. Here, some people are in dire straits. So it's very important that you still give zakat to, to people here. The people here have this, Muslims here have this notion that Everything you send the money back to your country. Yeah, you have to pay. The Muslims here that are poor. There's Muslims here in this masjid that have no money. It's not every single thing back to the country. But, it can't be everything you send, you give it back. Some people, they give, they'll send money to their relatives before they give it to their children here. The guy will have no washing machine in his house, no, no sofa property, and he's sending every month 200 pounds back to his family. What's this? And his children don't have anything. How many times growing up did you see it? The person, he doesn't even have good trainers to go to school. The kids are laughing at him. And his parent is sending £150 to someone that's not even his uncle. Someone who is a relative that is a far relative. But his own children, he doesn't pay for their welfare here in the country. So there has to be a change of mentality. I'm not saying don't send money there. But you have to prioritize your immediate community. And you can send money to your uncles. I'm not saying don't do that. But don't forget also there's people here that need zakat and, and things, things like that as well. Yes, Sakhi. So we're going to, inshallah ta'ala. I don't want to... Um, I don't want to um, uh, 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 jump the gun because there are some passages here that we haven't gone through and it deals with that. But the ulama say, for example, you give to a faqir and you give to a miskeen. A faqir, miskeen, a person in abject poverty. Man la yajid nisfu kifayatihi. Someone who doesn't find nothing at all. He's living like a person that's living on the streets. He doesn't eat. He, every new day is a new challenge. Now, how am I going to eat today? Am I going to steal from Greg's? Am I going to steal from Tesco? Am I going to break into some, someone who, or am I going to have to do X, Y, and Z? Am I going to have to maybe steal a bike and then have to sell the metal? Someone who doesn't find anything. I'm not saying that poor people steal. I'm not saying that. But someone who lives in abject poverty. The next person is the miskeen. The ulama say that the miskeen person, he's a bit higher than the faqir, meaning that he, he's not abjectly poor, but he's still struggling to get by. He can't pay all his bills. He can't do X, Y, Z. So the Sharia did not put a specific number on, like, the Sharia didn't say, whoever doesn't, has below 12 dinars is poor. The, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deliberately made the wording general so that it goes back now to the person who's giving zakat. Does this person have a lot? It changes from country to country. So in this country now, are you considered rich if you have a car? No. Are you considered rich if you have 500 pounds? No. But in some countries, if you have 500 pounds, you're considered rich. So it changes from country to country. We'll end it there, inshallah ta'ala. And we'll come back next week and we'll do the calculations. And we'll do the zakat on silver. And then we'll answer some questions regarding zakat of gold in terms of uh, what type of gold is given away. Is it gold for jewelry? Is it gold for... Uh, personal usage of gold for trade and things like that insha'Allah ta'ala and then we're almost finished insha'Allah niktafi bihad al-qadr wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in